Um, yeah, my name is Mark Hillebrand. I'm the Head of Professional Services for Apparition. Uh, we're a specialist augmented reality organisation and we started our journey about 10 years ago. Um, today we have offices in Australia, India and the US and that really helps us do some very rapid prototyping so that we can work pretty much around the, around the time, around the 24-hour uh, clock. Uh, and what we do is we work with our clients to help them shape their future, push some boundaries and find better ways to do things. That all started back uh, with our parent company, which was in the area of field services, had uh, field services people out, in, um, out servicing telecommunication towers, remote parts of Australia, and we needed to find better ways to help them do that rather than the phone calls, the big manuals, which is some of the stuff you've seen over the last few days. What I uh, won't, won't be doing today is talking too much about the technology, and I think uh, David's presentation just gave there really just shows how far this technology has come in probably the last 10 years, certainly the last two. You know, particularly brave to be doing a, a presentation, you know, four live demos, I think there were there in, in this sort of environment. So I think, you know, for me, the technology is no longer the, the issue. Uh, most of what we would like to do, think we could do, is actually now doable from a technology point of view. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So what I'm hoping in, in my presentation is today, you know, particularly being at the end of uh, a day and a half and you know most of the speakers you know the things we're talking about are you know similar similar themes there hasn't really been too much that I think many people would disagree with um, albeit that I guess we're all um, probably uh, converts uh, you know being at a technology conference and we're probably more the um, early adopters than than the laggards um, so we probably are talking to a bit of a, a converted audience there but um, so for those, I guess there'll be some of the things I say which, you know, you'll probably just, you know, yep, nod, that'll just reinforce that the path you're on is the right way and you're doing the right things, continue. For those that I guess haven't started the journey, um, hopefully there's some things that I can share with you which have been our learnings um, and that uh, will give you some thoughts of, as to how, how to take those first steps. So I guess the future, um, none of us are disputing that um, the disruptive technologies are reshaping our environment, and if they haven't done already, they will be doing it very shortly. There's nothing we can do about that. Um, AR and VR has been informed by decades of game design, um, and it will be this that is in the future modes of collaboration, learning and decision making in terms of how we, uh, we move forward. And again, there's probably nobody in the audience who hasn't grown up with some sort of form of computer games, but we, we still sort of lack some of that sort of uh, experience and uh, interface in, in a work environment. So what's making all of this change possible? And change typically comes around when a number of factors all come together. AR technology's been around for a long time. Um, but it really is a, the fact that we're getting into this era of digital transformation. It's made its way into nearly all industries and all parts of the supply chain. It's definitely not there yet, but it's certainly working towards that. So that's generating new products and services, new production methods, new ways of collaborating, and you've seen some of that sort of uh, over the last day and a half. And soon, uh, and there was a, a good presentation before about the digital twin, um, soon all of our assets will also be digital assets. Um, we did a project uh, late last year for Bosch in Germany. You know, in the past, we would have had to uh, create some fairly complex 3D models. They were able to just send us their CAD drawing, which they'd produced. Most organisations are designing their information in CAD now. Send it to us with a few tweaks. We were able to input that into Unity. And we had uh, 3D models that we could interact with and work with in a very short period of time. So why is this all important? And uh, you know, I guess you've had AR you know, hammered over you for the last two days, but just to put it in context, AR supplements the real world with virtual and digital objects that coexist in the same place as the real world. And, and I guess there's a whole discussion there is really what is real, you know? So in some ways, the whole lot is now real. So it combines that virtual and real objects into create what we're now thinking is the real, real environment, the digital. Uh, the, the context I guess I'd like to put this presentation in is, is, I said before, I think the technology's pretty much there. It will get better, cheaper, faster. 
But it's really, for me, it's about people and process that we need to focus on now. Our organisation, uh, we've spent 10 years sort of in this space and uh, we've probably spent a lot of effort in technology, but we're now moving more to really trying to understand the user. I, th I came across this quote the other day that um, from a leading educational um, academic sort of in the, in, in the leading areas of using uh, immersive technology um, out of, uh, so Kenneth Austin out of uh, Bristol University. And it's the second part of the quote that I guess really resonated with me most. And it was a, this bit about actively participating in the chaos that is and vividly imagining and influencing what will be. So traditional type of learning, traditional type of activity has been that cognitive area. Um, often, you know, it's not the real world. We're not really, it's what's the chaos that's there and, and we're living in a much more complex world than we were. So, so it's those two parts of, uh, I guess, the definition where I think immersive technology really lends itself to, uh, to what we're, we're trying to do. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of um, examples we've worked on the last uh, year that sort of demonstrates how we've used uh, augmented uh, reality to help deliver that. So the challenge, as I've said, it's not technology. It's actually about um, people and processes. Yes, the technology is getting better. It'll get better every day. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to think how quick some of this technology is changing, you know, and, and I guess quick, how time is, you know, a bit of a spectrum. But, you know, when was the smartphone first around, you know? Um, when, uh, you know, I think it was about 2001, 2002, um, I had a meeting with Docomo and they just launched 3G and they were telling us and a whole range of other broadcasters at this stage that they were seeing these trends in Japan where people were taking photos on their mobile phones and sending it to each other. And I've got to tell you, you know, I was at the ABC at that stage, 7, 9, 10, SBS, we all sat there and we thought, this is crazy. We had our DSLRs sitting on the table. Thought, no one's ever going to do that. You know, you know, tiny little megapixels. In less than two decades, you know, when we've thrown the DSLRs away, you know, we run around and we're doing videos. At a similar time, uploading a 90-second video onto the website was taking an hour and a half. You know, we now post them and do them on Facebook. So I think let's not underestimate how quick this technology Will, will change. But I think it's about the people and processes that um, is probably the area we really need to focus a bit more on. So I guess it's with that um, aspect that we've, um, we've recently sort of focused here. We've um, started to work now with a, um, a, a cognitive uh, organisational psychologist, a guy named Tony Wen. Um, he's, uh, some of you may know him, he's got some fairly extensive experience in, in the military. Uh, and we saw some of the work that um, I think Saab were, were doing there before, and I think the military is actually a good place to, to look. They've been doing a lot of this work uh, before, and, and uh, you know, um, someone made the comment before about pilot jumping into a plane without uh, having done any real flying. Well, the F-35, that's exactly what they do. I mean, fortunately, we don't have any passengers behind them, but there is no other training. There is no other jewel that's straight from the sim into there. So. Um, obviously a lot of trust and things that's uh, another topic we need to talk about. So we're um, working with Tony, we're sponsoring his PhD, and what we're really looking at is the change management and the human factors around augmented reality and what that's going to mean. So he shared with me sort of a, I guess, a brief slide, um, sort of said to me that, um, you know, at the end of the day, there's really only one human brain and one structure, how it works, but from an academic point of view, they break it down into, into these different areas so they can understand and study it. But from our point of view, what we really are interested in is learning more in depth about how are people learning? You know, um, what are they learning? Um, you know, in the current education system, in a classroom environment, you know, it, it's very different to, I guess, the real environment. And uh, I guess, the augmented reality area sort of brings us more to that, the exper experiential side there. So, you know, we're sort of trying to make sense of what am I seeing, what am I feeling, what am I doing? So uh, it's about that coordination of the hand and the eyes. So we really want to understand that a lot more. Um, and I guess it also adds some of so the issues around trust. Um, if people don't trust this technology, you know, where will we go from there? Will we, we see some pushback? So. Um, that's, that's really, I guess, the focus. The other po important part is, I guess, about the integration. 
And one of the things I think the biggest mistake we often see is that we think people think things are going to replace everything that we've seen before. TV didn't replace radio, didn't, you know, websites didn't replace print. In fact, you know, there's stacks of print on every stand. Sure, it gets reduced, um, but I think you know, what's really important is that it adds to it um, and it'll, it'll be part of the overall equation. But what's the challenge for us is to find out you know, which jobs, which areas are the, are the most applicable. Let's not just assume it's everything. Um, look also the issues of data capture and analytics, big data, that's been uh, covered before very much by, by IBM and others. It's the change management of the individual and, and, uh, and supporting them at all levels in the organisation. And another topic which I won't even touch on here is the privacy and the ethical issues where, you know, computer systems will make decisions that computers, uh, that humans would have taken way too long to, to make and what are the implications. So I've got a couple of uh, really quick um, examples that I want to show you. One is a project we did for Deakin University, an ongoing project called Ocular Sim. It's for uh, university students to really try to get in and understand how the eye, eye works. What was important about this was creating um, a 3D model, which has taken probably 18 months. And it started with 2D diagrams and really working with the professors has, I guess, uncovered things that we didn't even find, you know, weren't even there, questions that we raised in terms of creating those models. Um, it now is the most comprehensive, accurately correct model that's uh, available in the world. So I'll just play the, a video just to... Uh, So that's going to be launched to students very shortly. Um, up till now, it was looking at 2D books and things like that. So uh, we don't, you know, the, the interesting thing about that project is there's three levels. There's an explore level, a learn level where people log in, and an assessment area where we'll actually gradually deliver people more and more detail. But what would be really important is to analyse all the data and actually look at how, how much better the learning experience has been. Um, the uh, um, next one I'll quickly show you because I think time's running out is in the area of intelligent visualisation of risk um, and this is um, an important user case. Most of you have had something to do with risk know it's fairly simple. We've done a matrix like that, multiplied it out and come up with a, a, you know, a figure which bears no resemblance to the real world and obviously uh, reflects why, you know, machinery equipment issues don't reflect what we were planning on. So uh, we've been working with a, a leading consulting firm, a global firm, which is KPMG. Um, they have got all the mathematics behind it. Our job was to visualise this, so I'll just, the best way to do it is probably show you an example. So that video, I guess, doesn't do it justice. That's actually produced on a Microsoft HoloLens. We used augmented reality so that it could be in a shared environment, put on the table, and people can look at it. But the, date, the data and the detail behind that in terms of what we know with risks is one risk infects another risk and causes all these contagion effects. And the ability to interact with that data um, versus you know, the first slide you saw we believe is a significant user case for that. If you are a KPMG client, um, certainly ask to, to go to their innovation centre, have a look at uh, the, the real model, that's the prototype that's there, and obviously what's really important about the data will be it'll be uh, for their clients, it'll be that, that sensitive data um, of client information for decision making. So just in, in, I guess, in terms of wrapping up, a um, lot of where, where this industry is at, and I suppose it's, it's had a lot of hype for a whole lot of time, and uh, we're now in this sort of point of this trough of disillusionment somewhere there. So, you know, everybody's heard about it. We don't have to tell any of our clients about this, you, you've all that, but it's at that point waiting for things to come, come out. If we overlay on the bottom of that, I guess, the adoption of technology 
and I think you know we're somewhere in the early adopters. Sorry, the innovators have been out there. We you know four or five years ago produced prototypes of everything and anything, um, but with no real purpose in mind. People said, "Yep, that's good," and they shelved them. What's really been comforting to see, and I guess uh, today, is some of the really innovative, really good user cases, um, and that's really what's critical to move forward to the next case. So, how do we get through that uh, that chasm? And uh, my, I guess that's my last slide. So uh, this is where we work with our clients on journeys. It's actually really about identifying user cases that add some value. Um, the more value, obviously, the better. But we don't. We you know early on, going back to my mobile phone and the photos. We don't really know what people are going to do. Um, I think there was a case presented earlier today um, with the Swinburne uh, thing, where all of a sudden they found that there was. Uh, um, uh, muscle injuries, things they weren't expecting. So just in wrapping up, identify the user cases, really do rapid, low-cost proof of concepts to, to get them out there and to do some learning, identify those gaps, push some boundaries every time, and learn going forward. Thank you.